Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Alan Swanson, and I'm the lead uh, engineer for cloud networking uh, within Wells Fargo's uh, private cloud engineering team. And my name is Marcos Hernandez. I'm a staff engineer with the Networking and Security Business Unit at VMware, uh, business unit responsible for the NSX platform. So um, over the course of the last year, Marcos and I have had quite a few conversations uh, about uh, Neutron network deployment strategies in the enterprise uh, private cloud context. And so this, this session is kind of the culmination of a lot of those conversations that we've had. Um, but before we, we dive into the presentation, um, I think we'd like to get a kind of sense of the audience that we have today. So um, I guess the first question we'd like to ask is, um, how many of you are running uh, your OpenStack clouds with, uh, with, Neutron, with the Neutron networking model? Okay, so a fairly sizable number. Um, and then another question uh, we'd be interested in, in, in getting your feedback about is, uh, how many of you are, with your private clouds, are only allowing cloud-native workloads on those clouds? Nobody, <laughs> so it looks like it's nobody. So, okay, so let me ask the kind of the, the corresponding question, which is how many of you are, are, are running cloud-native workloads and legacy workloads on, on your cloud environments? Okay, so a fairly large number, and that's good to hear based on you know, some of the things that we're gonna say. Um, so let's, let's just dive into the first slide. Um, so as I said, you know, we're specifically gonna focus on enterprise private clouds uh, in this presentation. And we're going to assume a basic understanding of, of neutron network concepts like ports, uh, subnets, networks, um, and how all of those things kind of interrelate with each other. And uh, you know, as I've as I've read uh, and looked at a lot of the OpenStack uh, networking-related uh, information out there, um, it's it's really hard not to come to the conclusion that tenant networks are a foregone conclusion that you should be using using tenant networks and um, you know, really, that, that's really the way to go. Um, and so what we're going to try to present here is maybe a little bit of a contrarian view on that. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as, we've, as I've dug into tenant networks and what that kind of means in an enterprise context, it's, it's evident that there are some challenges associated with deploying tenant networks. Um, and so we're going to touch on a few of those. Um, and lastly, you know, I've got this slide up here of the, uh, you're probably familiar with this, the Batman and Superman movie that re recently came out. And uh, I actually haven't seen the movie. Marcos has, and he tells me that one of these, one of these guys dies. Um, I don't know who. It was probably for everybody. Yeah. Right. But uh, that's not the analogy that we're trying to draw here. I just want to, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be clear about that. There, Tenant networks and writer networks are both fundamentally good, but they're different. <laughs> right, right. And they, they each have strengths and weaknesses and optimal use cases, right? So we're, one doesn't have to lose for the other to win. It's not a win-lose proposition. That's, that's basically what we're trying to say. Um, so I think it's helpful to first talk about, okay, what's the difference between provider networks and tenant networks? And I think the, the difference that uh, is most readily evident is kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, built into the names, right? So it, it revolves around who provisions the networks. And obviously with provider networks, the OpenStack administrator provisions those on behalf of the tenants for use by the tenants. And the OpenStack administrator can decide whether to dedicate the provider network to a single tenant, to all tenants, or to a subset of tenants. And I, I wanna pay or uh, call out a feature that was delivered in Liberty um, that I'm actually very excited about, and that's role-based access control for networks. And that's very useful in the enterprise context if you're leveraging provider networks. And what that allows you to do is to basically, um, before RBAC for networks, it was an all or nothing approach, right? You either shared with all your tenants or a single tenant. But now we can actually um, share a network with a subset of tenants, right? And, that, and that's, that's highly useful. So on the other hand, tenant networks are provisioned by tenants for their own purposes. And based on default policy settings, they can't, those tenant networks cannot be shared with other tenants. Um, another difference between provider networks and tenant networks is that generally speaking, provider networks rely on the physical network infrastructure for um, default gateway or first hop routing services. Whereas with tenant networks, you're gonna rely on a Neutron router to provide those capabilities and uh, the Neutron router will have to be attached to a provider network that's marked as external to talk to the external physical network. Um, so what, what I'm depicting here on the left is obviously an example of a tenant network topology with two different tenants. 
and then on the right hand side um, I'm depicting a shared provider network so you have three tenants that are sharing a common layer 2 network with multiple instances deployed and so we're going to specifically focus on the value proposition of shared provider networks as a potential viable replacement for tenant networks um, lastly I think it's important to point out what's not different between provider networks and tenant networks and I think this could be a common misunderstanding for people and that relates to how do you instantiate the network whether it's a provider network or a tenant network and the point I'm trying to make here is that there really is no bearing or you're not forced to use an underlay technology or an overlay technology based on whether you want to use a provider network or a tenant network really those those things are decoupled from each other um, you know traditionally provider networks have been uh, VLAN backed right and then your tenant networks could be VLAN backed or overlay backed right but for example you could certainly provision an overlay network um, for for a provider network and then you could attach it to the physical network through, an, through a, a software or hardware layer 2 gateway so just trying to draw out the point that choice of technology to instantiate the network that, that in general has no bearing on whether you can use a provider network or a tenant network but certainly specific implementations might um, constrain your choices um, for example with NSX uh, tenant networks are instantiated with with VXLAN and you don't really have the option of, of using VLANs for that so okay so the the title of this slide um, could be controversial or sh it should be controversial um, but what, I, what we're trying to communicate here is that um, uh, um, that network security uh, is, is decoupled from network topology with some of the, um, the constructs that OpenStack provides to us. And this statement needs to be true for shared uh, provider networks to actually be a viable alternative to tenant networks. And so let me kind of explain that. So for you know, decades leading to present, the way you would implement network security in your network is you would force traffic through layer three boundaries, right? Because the only place you could implement filtering was at, uh, was at a layer three boundary, right? Using a, a, a router or, or, or a firewall. And more recently, um, some advanced techniques have been developed, uh, such as VLAN stitching, which is basically like a bump in the wire, but, but allows you to do filtering without forcing traffic through a layer three boundary. But there are some, um, flexibility challenges associated with that approach. But now with Neutron, we have the, uh, the, the constructs of security groups, logical ports, and, and port security. And all of these things together enable us to um, basically implement network security without being forced into a particular network topology. So um, as you're probably aware, you know, when, when instances attach to the network, they attach to a logical port. And there's some properties on the logical port that allow us to um, basically enable filtering on a per logical port basis. And um, port security basically allows us to prevent IP and MAC spoofing, right, which are common like layer two attack techniques. So these two capabilities together allow us to, to move from a model on the left uh, where your application tiers are using dedicated layer two networks and filtering is implemented at a layer three boundary, whether it's a neutron router or a traditional physical router or firewall, to a, uh, a paradigm where we have a, sh a common layer two network, uh, where, for example, in this case, we have two different tenants, and each of those tenants has multiple application tiers, and, and they are protected from each other by these security groups, but they're sharing a common layer two network. Um, so this is, uh, in, in my view, this is a, a paradigm shifting um, kind of uh, in, uh, capability, right? And I, I wonder if uh, many of us haven't really come to grips with this and, and, and in terms of what that might, the implications of what that might be in terms of our network design. And uh, Alan, if I may add, uh, another um, term that uh, this security brought into and uh, closer to, to the workload uh, is um, used in the industry is micro-segmentation. So new, Newton security groups enable micro-segmentation by bringing security closer to the application. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to need a perimeter router, a perimeter firewall anymore. There are always going to be flows and threats that are better stopped closer to 
uh, the perimeter of your data center. But neutral security groups, the idea here is that enable all the micro segmentation use cases by attaching security closer to a workload. Okay, so let's, let's dive into some of the challenges that we see with tenant networks. So the, the one that immediately drops, uh, kind of um, rears its head, has to do with um, address space selection. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with Horizon and uh, the dialog box where you have to specify the CIDR that you want to uh, associate with the, net, the tenant network that you're creating. And I would argue that um, many end users are ill-prepared or are incompetent to fill out this field, frankly. Um, and I think that um, selection of an address space, an appropriate address space, is actually a, more, a much more complicated um, process than you might first believe to, to be the case. Um, and let me elaborate on that a little bit. So even if you're using um, OpenStack source NAT or destination NAT, um, the reality is that it do that does not mean that you can pick any address space that you want and you'll be, uh, you'll be able to go on your merry way. Um, in the public cloud, which is it's a little bit different scenario, um, obviously, as you know, RFC 1918 space is not routable in the internet. So if tenants pick RFC 1918 space, um, there's no chance of a collision with consumers of the cloud that are coming from the internet, right? But in the enterprise context, RFC 1918 space has a very high likelihood, likelihood of being used. So it's just it's not possible to just pick some 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 prefix out of RFC 1918 space, throw it in there, and 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 be on your merry way. Um, so in this diagram here, I'm I'm, I'm basically depicting um, this tenant created this uh, tenant network called WebNet, 10.10.10.0 slash 24, but unbeknownst to the tenant, that network is actually being used in the enterprise somewhere. And effectively, um, what's happened is there's no way for that enterprise network to talk to that, to that tenant network or vice versa, because it's basically an address space collision. It's just not going to work. So the, the, the fundamental point I'm trying to make here is even if you're using NAT, um, you cannot just pick any address space you want in the enterprise context. Um, so all is not lost, however. I mean, subnet pools were introduced in Kilo to actually address this exact problem. And basically what a subnet pool is, is it's basically a, a block of address space, a large block of address space that you allocate to the cloud. And then uh, tenants, when they want to create a network, they can just request a prefix from the subnet pool um, within parameters, right, in terms of max prefix length or, or minimum pre prefix length. And so that's a mechanism to address this problem so that you can be guaranteed address space that won't collide with, with, other, with ex pre existing address space. Um, but obviously, one of the requirements there is that you be able to assign a large block of address space to your cloud. And that may not be, um, a, a, that may not be uh, an easy thing to accomplish. Um, as many of you know, um, IPv4 space is, is very scarce, um, registered address space, and it's practically been completely consumed. Um, so the reality is that tenant networks actually exacerbate this problem if you're going to choose to use um, registered address space, right? Um, because you're basically siloing, out, siloing away address space that has a much less higher, much less likely to be used um, completely versus, say, shared provider network address space. Um, and in large organizations like Wells Fargo, even RFC 1918 space is in very short supply, and it, it's not easy to to allocate a large block of address space even out of RFC 1918 space. Um, so, you know, the point that I'm trying to make here is that you know. Tenant networks actually put greater pressure on your address space than a shared provider network. Um, now, obviously, if you're using um, overlapping IPs, that's one way to kind of combat this problem. But there are, there are other concerns that overlapping IPs uh, present. Um, so NAT in the enterprise. So obviously, OpenStack was conceived primarily as a platform to deliver cloud-native applications. But you know, I asked the question at the beginning of the session, how many of you are building clouds solely for consumption by cloud-native applications, and nobody raised their hand. So it's obvious that, that there are going to be mixed workloads on clouds, right? 
And uh, NAT definitely has, a, has the probability of creating issues if you're um, using it to provide general compute services to your organization. Um, I find it interesting that there's actually an RFC. I mean, it's a bit, a bit dated RFC, but there's actually an RFC that was written to actually l list some of the protocols that break with NAT. Um, and um, the other point related to NAT uh, that I'd like to make is that you know one of the classic design principles in computer networking is the idea of, um, of uh, the end-to-end -end principle, which basically means that state should, as much as possible, be in the end systems and not in the network. And you know, NAT basically violates that principle. Um, and you, you can make your own, you, you probably all have your own opinions on, on you know, how you feel about NAT, but in my view, if you can avoid NAT, it's, it's a good thing. Um, and, and lastly, um, you know, Wells Fargo falls into this category, but certain organizations require that if you have a system on the network, that that system needs to be reachable for audit, audit and compliance reasons. So, if you're, if you're news, using NAT, you're gonna be forced into a situation where you have to do a one-to-one -one NAT. And if you're gonna do that, what's the point of NAT uh, anyway? You know, just get, get rid of NAT and be done with it and have some addresses that, uh, address spaces that are actually reachable from the rest of the enterprise. No, not, not to mention the fact that it's yet another IPAM system uh, that you have to manage if you have one-to-one -one NAT with uh, neutron allocations. So right. it's just adds to the complication of management. Right. Okay, so if we take a step back and we um, talk about uh, the way in which tenant networks have been traditionally connected to the enterprise, uh, the initial use case uh, that Alan mentioned for OpenStack Neutron that called for overlapping IP address space required that source NAT be implemented in the Neutron router. And that is a default workflow in Neutron when you create a router um, from Horizon, for example, and you attach then a network to that routing, router, there will be a global NAT uh, policy that will be instantiated on that router that will translate all the IP subnets for the tenant side into a global address space assigned to the uplink of that router. More recently, no NAT topologies have also been introduced in Neutron. So you can create a Neutron router, attach tenant networks, but disable NAT on that Neutron router, meaning that your tenant networks must be reachable by the rest of the, by the, rest of the enterprise. Uh, the issue with that is that as of um, today, and we, there have been talks, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, static routing is the only option to, um, to co create uh, adjacencies and, and reachability between the neutron router and your physical router that connects uh, to the rest of the enterprise. And uh, if, the, if we're talking a very large tenant environment, manipulating those statics routes may, may be very, very com cumbersome. Um, there are ways to uh, create summary routes and specify the default gateway for that large address space, but as Alan mentioned, in large organizations where you don't have the ability to aggregate all these ciders, this may not even be possible. But I, we, we just wanted to mention that uh, these are the two traditional ways of uh, enabling tenant reachability by use of neutron routers. Yeah, and, and one point I wanted to make is that even if you're using uh, tenant networking with source NAT or destination NAT, notice that even in that case, you're dependent on a provider network that's been marked external that was previously made routable in order to have connectivity to the physical network. So there's, there's our, even in with tenant networking, there's a dependency on provider networks to actually reach the rest of the uh, environment. Provider networks so. to the rescue. So. Um, Static routing is uh, by, by far uh, the uh, way in which, like I said, in no NAT topologies, neutron routers are being connected to the rest of the enterprise uh, network. Um, but there are conversations in OpenStack uh, of enabling dynamic routing support. And when we do that, and uh, with the expectation was that Liberty was gonna include an initial implementation of a BGP speaker, um, BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, being the dynamic routing uh, uh, choice, that is going to mitigate the management of all these uh, static routes. However, we're not quite there yet. And uh, at VMware, we're experimenting with ways in which you, without necessarily changing the way that Neutron works, or if you're not necessarily at the OpenStack version that uh, enables dynamic routing support, you can still get some support for dynamic routing that is synchronized with the IP address space of your tenant networks. And I'm showing here an example um, that leverages 
heat orchestration to create a VM and give it personality using the metadata service of Nova and the user um, uh, data that uh, can be configured within heat and give that VM a personality, which in this case is using an open source, open source implementation of uh, dynamic routing with VGP, Quagga. You could pick you know, any, any other one. This is just an example. Uh, let me just emphasize that this is not the way in which you do dynamic routing uh, today. This is just a way, just to create some initial uh, and hopefully um, productive conversations with your network team. Uh, but the idea here is that um, the OpenStack network uh, implementation doesn't really know that there is this dynamic routing relationship happening between the Quagga VM and the rest of the enterprise infrastructure, but HEAT creates a level of abstraction and synchronization that can help um, create uh, that illusion of synchronization. So again, it's just one, one example. We added a link to the VMware GitHub where you can download and explore and experiment with this HEAT template. So it's uh, an interesting implementation. Again, it's a stopgap approach until we get full and formal dynamic routing support in Neutron. And um, if you use Neutron routers, and I like this quote, <laughs> we put it here in the, the first bullet, this is Alan's quote. Well, if you're depending on the Neutron router, you're depending on the Neutron router. And what, what, what that means is that um, Frankly speaking, uh, a neutron router does not have, and I don't think, we don't think it will ever have the capabilities and features that an enterprise uh, routing uh, platform has incorporated and supported for many, many years. And I don't think that's the um, goal of neutron routers in, in any case. The idea of the neutron routers is to connect tenant environments to the rest of the enterprise uh, network. Uh, not necessarily to get into a feature race with established routing platforms, a feature race that Neutron is never going to win. Um, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to catch up to 30 years of networking, nor do we have to. Um, having said that, there will be features that you will need as you use and incorporate and develop OpenStack in your private cloud environment. And these features could be table stakes. And they're typically driven by the application profile. So if we're talking, for example, about an application that requires some multicast support that has to cross routing boundaries, that means that your routers need to support multicast routing, protocol independent multicast, for example. Uh, and that is not in Neutron. So you will find the situation where Neutron doesn't really give you the ability or the capability as a routing solution to enable the right connectivity for your application. And we just picked this one as an example, but there could be others. And there could also be limitations that are specific to anyone's uh, vendor implementation. So just a reminder that um, there are dependencies, and you need to go into this uh, selection of your neutron topologies with your eyes wide open. It's a problem that you don't have if you leverage provider networks and rely on a physical router sitting in physical address space to uh, provide all these routing services. Yeah, and, and what, what, what Marcos just mentioned, you know, if, if you're only deploying cloud native workloads, this might be a non-issue for you. But again, back to if you're if you're if you're deploying uh, legacy applications that you don't necessarily know what those tenants are requiring. Uh, from a connectivity standpoint, or point communication standpoint, th th this could be a very real issue for you. Um, so, okay, so what's the impact of IPv6 on everything that we've just said? Well, obviously, um, address space scarcity is, uh, and I worded this this way on purpose, is not a concurrent concern with IPv6. Now, I know it's a massively huge address, uh, you know, address space, but it, it's not a current concern. So there, there's no reason why we can't allocate large blocks of IPv6 address space to subnet pools, which effectively eliminates the address space selection problem for tenants. Um, Alan, if yeah. I may, real quick, um, is there? A, can you raise your hand if there is a mandate within your organization to explore or migrate or use IPv6? Okay, so yeah, a good number of people. Thank you. So you know, with IPv6, there's there's no reason why we can't allocate unique routable address spaces to everyone, and there really shouldn't be a reason to be forced to use NAT, right? Um, and just as a side note. Um, the most recent information that I've read indicates that there's no intention to provide floating IPs with IPv6. Um, I did run across uh, a little bit of snippet 
indicating that there, there is work being done on what's being called floating IP-like support. But um, the, the idea there is to avoid NAT to implement that, but actually just use, because IPv6 address space is so plentiful, but act to actually use IPv6, multiple IPv6 addresses to actually provide that support. So um, there's no, the, to, to the best of my knowledge, there's no, there's no plans to support uh, NAT with IPv6 with OpenStack. Um, so even, but even in this case with IPv6, IPv6 doesn't solve all of our problems because tenant network reachability is still an ongoing challenge until we get formal dynamic routing protocol support in, in, in Neutron. So that, that's still an, an ongoing issue. Um, hopefully that will be addressed relatively shortly. Um, but I, I think the fundamental question still remains, um, now that we have security groups and port security, do we still need to provision dedicated layer two broadcast domains um, for every tenant, or can we effectively replace that with a shared layer two environment and layer on the security services on top of that? I think it's an important question, question for us to ask ourselves. So, so what are the benefits of provider networks now that we've kind of listed some of the, 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 the kind of the pain points with tenant networks? Well, it, the, 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 the benefits line up quite, quite well against the, the kind of the drawbacks of, of tenant networks, right? So, Provider networks are pre-created. They're already there. What's, what's quicker than a network that's already been created, pre-created for your use, right? I mean, there's nothing faster than that, right? Um, and frankly, I would argue that um, for most tenants, and, and definitely in Wells Fargo's case, um, being the, 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 pro the process of having to provision a network, select an address space, make sure that it's routable, like that, that's basically a burden for end users that most end users would really prefer not to, to have to deal with. Um, and they, they, most of them would probably don't feel competent, actually, in, in doing that. Um, and as I stated previously, shared provider networks have a high likelihood of, of making very efficient use of your address space because you can consume the entire address space and then just allocate another provider network when you've run out of the, uh, you know, the, the address space in the existing provider network. And, um, I, and I'll just, I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, but you know, if, if we can actually effectively implement application tiering uh, and security zones, Using security groups and, and port security, um, why, why don't we why don't we seriously consider that as a viable option to to the proliferation of tenant networks and these dedicated layer two environments? Um, and and certainly it's possible if if there's a mandate to to provision a dedicated layer two environment for a specific use case, you can certainly um, provision a provider network that's been dedicated to a particular talent tenant. So that's, that capability is not off the table. It's still there available for your use. Uh, and w w one additional comment, hopefully it, it is clear that um, these options don't really change uh, the primary uh, tenet of OpenStack in keeping the APIs open and exposing that to the tenants. What we're really proposing here is a hybrid consumption model in which the network admin of, that is responsible for that OpenStack uh, network services does work on behalf of the tenant, and then the tenant uses some, some of the other OpenStack services or API services to consume capacity in the cloud. But uh, it, hopefully it is clear that everything happens at an API layer in OpenStack. It's just that we have two different personas doing different things when it comes to networking, which we think, we strongly believe, is the right model for Platform 2 applications and the enterprise use case for private cloud. Right, right. So, so in conclusion, uh, I think what we want to leave you with is uh, kind of a more balanced view of provider networks versus tenant networks. I think that there's been a lot of focus uh, and emphasis on tenant networks as a, kind of like the go-to go model for providing um, connectivity for your, for your customers. But I think provider networks you know, have a lot to offer um, in terms of reduced complexity uh, and uh, simplifi simplification. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I use this kind of statement, you know, provider networks are not the poor cousin of tenant networks, right? I mean, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot going for provider networks. You shouldn't discount them. And as you look at your own network deployment strategies, uh, you should definitely give provider networks uh, you know, due consideration as, as, you, as you make your deployment decisions. So do you have anything you want to add in terms of like personal, personal what you've seen personally? And, uh... Yes. Um, as you know, in my capacity as a pre-sales engineer at a VM where we talk to a lot of customers, and one thing that is a common theme, and, and, and Alan actually you know, told me the other day, it's incredible that this is not more 
broadly discuss in, in online forums or uh, with, with the vendors. But it's, de it's definitely true that we're seeing uh, enterprise networking uh, a, a, as an impediment uh, to more OpenStack ado adoption. So let, let, me, let me explain what that, what that means. Um, enterprise networks that are uh, using applications that are long-lived, that require routable IP address space, and that are faced with this model where the tenant is in charge of the network allocation and network creation, see a, a problem there. So we, what we want to do is um, really educate. We, 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 I see this with a, with a lot of customers. I, I, don't, I don't really, I can't really leave the, uh, the, give that tenant the option to create all these uh, routers and create all these load balancers and create all these IPs because this is infrastructure that requires you know, specific connectivity. It has a specific connectivity need. So we see this across the enterprise. And like I said earlier, it's typically the application profile driving uh, that need. So what we want with this session and also a super user article that Alan uh, authored is educate uh, the community and offer and provide the information that so you can see the choices that you have and see that OpenStack networking is not incompatible with legacy apps that you may want to run in that private cloud implementation that you will likely run based on you know the survey uh, and, uh, that we did here. So hopefully that's, uh, that's clear. Uh, and like I said, it is confirmed by multiple discussions that we have with other enterprise customers. Yeah. So we have a few minutes, and, and I'm glad we have some, a few minutes at the end, because we definitely would like to um, entertain any questions or comments that you would have about what, what we've had to say today. So. Thank you for the presentation. Just two cents. The first one, it's not one or the other. You can, we can use, we have been using both the provider and the tenant networks hosting the legacy applications almost two years now, one, two tier ones in the US. Tenant networks mainly for VNF backend communication, provider for the front end communication. Yes, yes. And hearing a person from VMware saying that DVR will never be as good as a vendor provider virtual router. I think we, I kind of heard this similar statement for the hypervisor wise, at least for the type one. Now we have the ironic, thank you. Okay, great, right. thank you. Yeah, that's running networking services directly on bare metal, right? What you, what you just mentioned. Yep. We, we see that uh, use case. In fact, I mean, we had to delete a slide in the interest of time that was showing some options in which provider networks and tenant networks are actually used in, com in combination. And the case for applications that are dual home, uh, for example, is a perfect example. You have a front end NIC that connects to a tenant network, for example, and that does all the application data, and a back end NIC that connects, for example, to a backup network for application monitoring, management, or patching. So that is, that is absolutely true, and uh, uh, I agree with your statement. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're still using Nova Network, so I'm not really familiar with neutron security groups and how they work. But if they're anything like Nova Network, if you do have a shared provider network and you're relying on neutron security groups for tenant isolation, uh, would that mean that if I'm a tenant and I decide to you know, have everything open on my security groups, that any other tenant could, is in my broadcast domain and could actually yeah. Reach me on a layer two level. That, that's true, and so one of I mean we didn't we figured we didn't have time to actually talk about this in this session, but Good question. one one of the things we're 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 looking at is how we can uh, take security groups potentially out of the tenant's hands and put it in like a security administrator's hands. So basically, the tenant can't shoot themselves in the foot. Yeah, but basically. arguably that's not cloud anymore, right? Yeah, there's so there's some tensions between. Uh, Self-service provisioning and separations of duty, which right. is kind of a basic tenet of network, of network security, especially in a lar large organization, uh -huh. right? So there's definitely some tensions and things to be worked out there. Cool. Um, but I would argue there's, even with a tenant networking model, you still have to, there's still no um, filtering that naturally takes place between those, just because you have different broadcast domains, there's no, there's no security inherent in that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you don't have layer two adjacency, but you have to put firewalls of service on there to actually separate. So I would argue this problem is no different. Mm -hmm. Right, and and we we were very very careful not to get very implementation specific. But uh, given the question, I'm going to volunteer some information that is as specific to the way Neutron and NSX interoperate. We're working right now on this notion of provider rules for security groups, where the admin of the Neutron uh, piece of OpenStack instigates configuration that gets configured at the top of the 
uh, firewall table of our distributed firewall. And then anything below that is uh, in the hands of the tenant. So you can create rules that create isolation and a shared layer too, and then have the tenants you know, secure their applications like they normally would. But, but just to be clear, that is specific to the Neutron and NSX implementation. Okay. Thank you. Any, any other uh, questions or comments? Look at that. Okay. Right on time. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.